All right, great. I think we're going to kick things off and we'll get going with our webinar and the others will catch us on the way. I see uh, the chat is already going wild. I love to see that. So you're all very welcome. And I'll formally say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. And welcome to this webinar on local organizations and health information systems, where we will be discussing the opportunities for local institutions to sustainably strengthen health information systems in countries. We appreciate that you're obviously inundated with invites to a multitude of webinars and online events and are therefore very excited that you chose to be with us here today. Uh, this fifth webinar in the Thought Leadership series on HIS is hosted by a five-year program funded by the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, called the Country Health Information Systems and Data Use Program, and we fondly refer to it as CHISU. CHISU is a consortium of partners led by JSI and includes vital strategies who are on our panel today and RTI, Gemnet Health, Gembi, and Macroize, who have all features uh, who have all featured in our previous panels. There are also 15 resource partners providing technical support, Data Science Limited being one of them that Lynette is representing on the panel today. CHISU emphasizes strengthening country HIS across all health programs by helping them progress through a, continu a, a continuum of improvement. My name is Derek Kunaka, for those who I have not met yet. I work for JSI, and I am the Director for Health Information Systems on the CHISU program. I will facilitate today's conversation with a panel of speakers who have a lot of experience to share with us on the role of local organizations in sustainably progressing country health information systems. Before introducing you to them, um, a quick reminder of our webinar logistics so that everyone is fully participating. Our webinar is in English with no translation services. Um, it will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel after this. If you have not subscribed, please go ahead and do a quick search of the Chisu program on YouTube. At Chisu, you'll find a Finnish pop star. But if you go to the Chisu program on YouTube and subscribe and like our videos, uh, you will see past webinars that we have had. And you can also find this recording once we are complete. We use the chat box to communicate to our technical support team. So please let them know if you're having any issues with audio or viewing the webinar and they'll help you out. Next to note is that questions for the panelists go into the Q&A box, not the chat box. If you indicate a panelist you would like to direct your question to, it makes it easier for them to respond to you. Please stay on mute so that we can focus on the panelists and what they have to share with us. There will be no slides shared this is a discussion between and with our panelists, and we want to now move on to the discussions of the day. So the objectives of our discussion today are as follows. First, we want to discuss approaches to engage local or regional partners so that they can sustain and enhance HIS strengthening efforts. We would like to share considerations for international and local partners on how to partner effectively with the government towards this end. We'll hear stories of the journeys of local organizations, uh, talking about pitfalls, lessons learned, recommendations from their own experiences. And we also want to reflect on what value training, mentorship and organizational capacity strengthening potentially adds to participation of local organizations in the health information system. Next, on the, um, um, on, over the last four webinars, we have been concerned with the, with the maturity of the national health information system and how to measure system maturity and evolution using the HIS stages of continuous improvement as a reference framework. Uh, uh, the SOCHI, uh, which is that stages of continuous improvement, has a measurement tool which is used to assess current and forecasted status of country HIS across five core domains that you see on the left, and then the components on the right. 
the core domains of governance and leadership, management and workforce, ICT infrastructure, standards and interoperability, data quality and use have been the focus of our discussions so far. Today, we want to unpack how local organizations can facilitate the advancement of country HIS across these stages of continuous improvement over time. Thinking of this in comparison to short to medium term interventions that are the extent of participation that non-local organizations can potentially have. On the next slide, we um, discuss what um, we have, uh, please just skip to the next slide. We have mentioned um, this before that an HIS is a set of components and procedures to generate usable data. The way we think of these components is through an organizing framework called the HIS strengthening model. We have emphasized each of the components that you see on this model in previous um, webinars, which are the enabling environment, um, information generation, and HIS performance. So since we've discussed them in detail, I won't talk about them today, but just to mention that the human element is, uh, the human element is another component that un underpins all others and is the foundation for HIS strengthening with contextual factors being critical support factors for sustaining efforts being made. We believe that local and regional organizations have an important role to play in ensuring that donor funded projects that you see at the top there, including government reforms funded by a country's treasury, for example, as well as global initiatives uh, contribute effectively to the HIS. We should also remember that there is private sector involvement, especially at sub-national levels where management of daily HIS operations is often delegated to. If you could just skip back to the previous slide on considerations, thank you. A few considerations for our panel to bring into the discussion when thinking about local partners. Um, first, the need for an HIS that can withstand current and future shocks. Uh, another consideration is the fulfillment, fulfillment of the competencies necessary for effective management of the health information system. We also are possessed with uh, considering the importance of continuity of managing these HIS uh, initiatives at the sub-national level and how local organizations can participate there, as well as the presence of various platforms such as communities of practice that have local um, that have the local context and how that can be weaved in. A couple of other considerations are what organizational and technical capacity is required to manage grants and implement programs at the appropriate level of quality. And our panel hopefully will also um, bring in um, their thoughts about the difference between ensuring equal access to opportunities versus ensuring fair and equitable access based on capacity, competence, and capabilities. Now that I've bored you enough, let me introduce you to our panelists and get into our discussion. Um, we've already met, I'm moderating the session, and you're welcome to follow me and the organizations that I represent on the social media handles listed on the slide. A more interesting person to meet is Lynette, who will be our first panelist uh, of the day, and she has a story to share with us to, uh, to kick us off. So Ms. Lynette Kwamboka is the founder of Data Science Limited, a data engineering firm focused on building information systems that help organizations make informed decisions. Data Science Limited is a resource partner on Chisu, Lynette also consults at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data as the Africa Program Manager. <clears throat> this entails supporting activities and programs for countries with the data they need to tackle the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and enhancing the tracking and achievement of the SDGs. Lynette was a, a Mozilla Foundation Fellow Consultant at the World Bank and UNDP and project manager for the Kenya ICT Authority on the Kenya Open Data Initiative and Open Government Partnership. Her background is in computer science, hello fellow computer scientists, data analysis and geographic information systems. Lynette is, has, has um, been formally recognized as one of the world's 
100 Most Influential People in Digital Government and was a top three finalist in the Bloomberg Award of Global Open Data Champions. So Lynette, as a champion, this is great. Uh, I'm sure that one of the many reasons that Data Science Limited decided to join the CHISU Consortium was to get access to business opportunities where your expertise in information systems development could be utilized to do good. As the founder of the firm, Please, can you share with us what led you to start the business in Kenya and what have been the key enablers and barriers for your team to help strengthen country health information systems so far? Over to you, Lynette. Great. Uh, thank you, Derek. And uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. As you've had, uh, my name is uh, Lynette Komboka and uh, I'm based in Nairobi, very cool today, um, but yeah. Um, so Data Science Limited was uh, uh, a company that I started in 2013. Uh, so we will uh, be cutting 10 years in, in a couple of uh, years. And the uh, thinking behind that, thank you, um, was I got a platform to explore, exchange knowledge and meet people from a very global platform um, and and see what has been done out there and every time I would come back home I would just be thinking what more could I do um, you know being a generalist for me the uh, the natural progression really was to start a company and and try to do more I have a passion in teaching and sharing information um, and um, you know decided why not go in and um, start something where I can work with a team of people also with that understanding of um, I could be smart but I do not know everything there are people who you know could complement um, my ideas, my experience, my expertise. Um, and yeah, that, that is basically how data science uh, was born. Um, and at the very beginning, the focus was really to do anything and everything uh, that uh, involves and includes data. Uh, so we did projects in agriculture, in health, uh, you know, in education, uh, in governance. Um, I, I did a few stints uh, in Somalia uh, and just exploring what really could catch on and what would um, would work really well. Um, and one of my biggest motivations uh, really in starting the company and doing the work that we do uh, was seeing that there were big companies, you know, the likes of uh, IBM, Microsoft that were setting, um, you know, offices in, in, in Kenya. And um, a lot of my former um, classmates were joining this company. So it gave me that motivation of saying um, the biggest advantage the bigger companies have is they have the resources and they started early. Um, but then in terms of um, experience expertise, if they're hiring my fellow, you know, uh, my former classmates and schoolmates um, from, of course, uh, of course, the School of Computer Science, um, why can't I just do something similar uh, or, you know, um, go in and do something uh, with my skills uh, without being, um, boxed is not the right word, but without being boxed in, you know, maybe working on one project over a, a long time. Uh, so went in, uh, started uh, my company, and there was a lot of you know lessons, um, and mostly we, we 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 did a lot of good work. We continue to do a lot of good work, work that I am uh, very proud of. Um, and some of the things that have really worked out well for us is being trusted within um, you know the country, within the ecosystem, as people who can deliver. Uh, quality and this did not come, you know, very easy. Uh, of course, sometimes you would have conversations uh, with with people, and before you know, it, they go to the bigger companies, especially when it is government. So uh, Derek has, um, you know, read out my profile. A lot of my students are as independent consultants within government, within uh, development partners, uh, and in most cases, this is because they could not hire my uh, my firm because in in some cases, we were too small. Um, you know, they require your bank statement to look a certain way. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so it's just easier for them to hire Linux than to hire, uh, for example, Data Science Limited. Um, but that said, we, as I've mentioned, we've done some really exciting projects. And one of the uh, projects within uh, the health sector was in the managed equipment services, uh, where the government, you know, working with uh, uh, GE uh, and a few other uh, partners, um, 
give health equipment to the counties in Kenya. Um, you know, the, the uh, government structure in Kenya is uh, uh, devolved. So we have 47 counties and the counties uh, took out, um, you know, equipment um, and they were paying towards this. And we came in and developed dashboards and information systems really uh, that were analyzing, visualizing, presenting, disseminating, communicating this data. So at a, any given point in a day, for example, you would know how many x-rays have you know happened for the country uh, how many of these were men versus women and how many you know icu cases have been done and and, and things like that um <clears throat> another of my things um in healthcare uh, which is uh, uh, quite exciting is uh, my brother happens to be a neurosurgeon and when he's in his school the question was you know he had all these very good offers within um you know good hospitals in the country um and i looked at that and said how about we start a business um you know we start um a, a, a health equipment uh, supply business and uh, this over a period of five years morphed into us owning you know a hospital and um, now owning a pharmacy and kind of looking at that ecosystem and uh, the way it's evolving and what the demand is like within um, the health sector um, in Kenya. But that said, um, there are of course challenges that I have seen uh, along the way. And, 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 and part of that is something that I have mentioned in terms of being seen as too small. Um, we are self-financed over the, you know, the past uh, uh, seven years. We, uh, to eight years now, uh, we have been um, so what's uh, uh, famously known as bootstrapping, um, basically because of the challenges that I have seen some of my uh, entrepreneurial friends face when it comes to um, fundraising. So that means that sometimes you're restricted in the kinds of projects uh, that you can take. So we have to partner, for example, with the uh, likes of DSI to be able to then approach the bigger uh, chunks of work. Um, we have statutory um, limitations in terms of you know, small companies and uh, what you're expected to uh, represent and report uh, when it comes to um, you know, the government. Uh, client acquisition um, is, is another big challenge uh, when you are a small company uh, in terms of what kind of portfolio of clients uh, you can go for and finally talent uh, retention uh, as well some people you know some organizations would come into the country and target software engineers um, you know with a very big paycheck uh, but a very quick small story this morning I just hired someone uh, who left our organization three years ago to join an organization and they were laid off because of corona and uh, applied back to us and we were you know available uh, to take them on um, as much as we had to scale back and do a lot of things. We figured out the sustainability long game uh, a very long time ago, uh, where we do not uh, sacrifice our points, uh, so to speak, uh, in situations where there's hardship. So there have been some challenges, but we've also had tremendous successes that we are very proud and happy about, um, and very okay, happy to are. continue engaging in the health sector. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Lynette. So I really like the emphasis on trust uh, and uh, the building of an ecosystem, which I hope we can actually unpack a little bit later. So that sounds exciting. And I'd like to hear more about the thinking that happened when you decided to diversify. Thank you, Lynette. Let's move to our next uh, panelist. Um, and our next panelist is uh, Mr. Benjamin Winters. Uh, ben is uh, actually um, in the US right now, but he is uh, usually and traditionally based in in Zambia. And Mr. Benjamin Winters is the COO and co-founder, as well as regional director for Africa for Acros Inc., an economically disadvantaged small women-owned business based in Zambia that works on data-driven systems to improve the health and well-being of disadvantaged communities. Ben is a global expert in geospatial systems design and development, surveillance system arch architecture, and adaptive management. He designed and implemented the largest community-based WASH initiative in Zambia, coordinating field teams over a four-year period across 15,000 villages, 67 districts, and nine provinces reaching over 9 million rural Zambians and generating over 4 million new users of improved sanitation. So Ben, 
with ACROS having supported HIS enterprise architecture design and implementation in over 25 countries with donor support, you have obviously a unique regional perspective of what the HIS and digitalize, digitalization issues are for countries. Please, could you share with us what in your experience should be the primary considerations for donors who want to unlock the value in local organizations for sustainable progression of the HIS. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Derek. I, I find myself looking around to see who you're talking about with that introduction. That sounds pretty impressive. Um, you're being very gracious. I think, and we have worked in a lot of countries and watched the progression of donors engaging uh, local institutions at very, very varying degrees. Uh, and there's a few things that come to mind when I think about what donors can be uh, prioritizing and where the considerations they can bring to their minds when trying to engage. Um, and I think the first and foremost one is that uh, most of the target countries that uh, we'll be working in, especially through Southern and Eastern Africa and Southeast Asia, um, is that there's extraordinary talent in those countries. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the objectives, and if you look through kind of the results frameworks, uh, that CDC and USAID would be um, promoting or using to define their programs. Uh, a lot of what, uh, a lot of the inputs that would be required can be sourced locally. Uh, so just in terms of raw talent and the availability, it's, it's usually there in country. I haven't really seen a country where that's not the case. Um, so that's the first point. So, so don't lose hope, donors. Um, keep looking and, and this is a worthwhile investment. I think the second thing and probably most important in terms of really unlocking the engagement of local institutions and local talent um, is to recognize that, especially in the health informatics space, HIS broadly, HMIS, um, that donors really are the primary market maker uh, for those industries in target countries, um, which means that really outside of donor activity, local HIS capacity um, institutionally isn't really going to exist. Um, there, there are very limited private sector and uh, even more limited government resources available um, to, to sort of maintain and cultivate uh, HIS institutions outside of the donor cycles. Uh, and so that puts the donors, I think, in a very unique position of, of really being the kingmakers for these local institutions. So um, if you want to engage the local institutions, recognize that that responsibility is primary on, primarily on you as a donor. Um, and, and part of the way that you can do that and start cultivating that market, um, I think there's two ways that donors can do that. So, so if you come to the realization that you are responsible as a donor for cultivating that market because HIS as an industry um, really rises and falls in the donor community, um, you can do two things. I think the first is, is define your product. Um, HIS progression and um, sustainability is, is a, a, a topic and a domain that's, that's come under increasing precision over the last three to five years. Um, measure evaluation did a lot of work in defining uh, maturity models and interoperability models, but, uh, but I think as a, as a whole, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a black box. And so you can work more specifically to define what it is that you're looking for in measurable and actionable terms. What models are you using? Are your vendors in these target countries familiar with those models? Um, are you using jargony language to describe things that can be otherwise more clearly articulated in terms of inputs and outputs? Um, and once you've defined those inputs and outputs, what can you source locally? Um, what's more appropriate to source internationally. Um, I think doing some more work on that side of the equation will be um, extremely helpful when you're looking to make the markets in the target countries. And then the second point, which is more of a structural issue, is that you can really start to um, address the market in such a way that suits your vendors. Um, if, if you want, and, and this is coming from the assumption that if, if you do want to start engaging local institutions as a donor, uh, you need to start funding local institutions. Um, that is what making the market means. Um, and, and that's directly related to the sustainability of those organizations. Um, so if you want to start funding them, there's a few things that donors can look at. Number one, um, use contract vehicles that don't set unrealistic accounting expectations. Um, in my experience, that's probably the primary hurdle uh, that local institutions face when trying to seek donor funding. 
Uh, is it the types of accounting frameworks and cost control environments um, and audit requirements, both in and outside of the program, uh, are so cumbersome that only a select few organizations worldwide would be able to satisfactorily meet those standards. And those organizations tend to group themselves around the beltway and take the funding as it comes. So if you wanna get away from that beltway bias and look for the local institutions, then start to redo your contracting mechanisms so that local organizations um, can really engage them locally. Um, the second thing that you can do as a donor is to set internal quotas. PEPFAR has done a great deal of work in this regard. Uh, to shift away from Beltway recipients to more local institutions. Uh, so if structurally you start mandating and, and define what local institution actually means so that you don't have shadow organizations being set up as has happened under PEPFAR. Uh, once you've defined that set quotas for institutionally at the global level, what percentage of funding you want to see go into that local institution uh, pipeline, then that will help keep some accountability to your actions in that end. And then I think the third thing that you can do is to communicate clearly and frequently to target vendors, actively work to reach out uh, to help those vendors understand what it is that you're looking for in terms of that product that you've defined in the third point that I raised earlier, uh, what it is that they need to do in terms of procurement. And that's part of the market definitions that we're talking about now so that they're very, very aware of when these opportunities will be posted, how they will be posted, what they need to do on the procurement side, and how that all shapes back to the product that they're gonna be um, offering back to your firm. So I think those are a few ways. There's a lot of structural concerns, I think in the uh, donor industry at, at large that um, at, you know, in present and uh, over the last 10 to 15 years sort of uh, make it clear that they're not really interested in working with local institutions, but if they are interested in, in changing that and starting to cultivate local institutions, I think that those are four points that they can start to look towards to make that happen. Great, thanks very much for that. So I picked up a couple of things which I'm gonna repeat. Uh, I like the emphasis on jargon. <laughs> and uh, I think there's so many ways we can relate that to local context because you know jargon, if it doesn't match the local context, then you know, you're having separate conversations. I love that you've taken us to market forces and who determines the market and uh, the role that the different stakeholders play there. So that's that's excellent, and I think that's a whole discussion. That's a whole discussion in itself. And then the most valuable thing that you've also said is this "keep hope alive" idea. You know, um, <laughs> uh, giving up is so much easier to do than plugging away and keeping at it. And both from the side of the um, the local partners as well as from the side of the donors. So thank you very much for that initial. Input, Ben. We'll come back to you for a second round of questions. For now, I'm going to move to. Serbia, we have a representative from Serbia with us today. Her name is Jelena Bojovic, and um, she is with NALID. Um, and I'm going to also uh, introduce her to you in a very meaningful way. Uh, Jelena is an expert in policy reform and implementation of economic development policies. She has been engaged in the reform of legislative process and regulatory frameworks by establishing partnerships between the public and private sectors for the past 20 years. Elena worked with the International Republican Institute on the development of local institutions and headed the local economic development team in USAID's Municipal Economic Growth Activity Program, where she supported local communities to boost their economies. Elena has also contributed to more than 50 economic development strategies in more than 30 local governments in Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ukraine, Slovakia, Kyrgyzstan and Jordan. She is currently the policy director at NALID, where she coordinates the efforts of the Association of Businesses to dialogue with the government related to key regulatory reforms. Yelena is also, when she's a little bit bored, a molecular biologist and engineer of genetics and is a physiologist by education. I don't know where you find the time, Yelena. So Yelena, Chisu collaborates, of course, with NALID um, that has enabled significant reforms in Serbia, the current one being digitalization and technical transformation for which the Serbian government formed a digital health coordinating body. 
Can you share with us what role donor and government funding has played in your contribution to the digitalization effort? And educate us on how you have cultivated a productive multi-sectoral relationship with government by engaging the private sector. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. First of all, just to tell you, when I was studying molecular biology, I was thinking, you know, and I didn't work in this area for, I think, 15, 15 or more years. So I was always working in the area of uh, policy design, but in other sectors like construction and so on. So finally, I'm in my field, meaning that I'm working in the health um, uh, sector improvements. So some, finally, I feel where the time where the, that I'm supposed to be. So let me just say a bit more about knowledge just to understand how we fit uh, here and uh, what is our role in the uh, reform of um, health information systems in Serbia. Uh, first of all, knowledge is, as you said, an association of businesses, local governments, but also civil society organizations. We were formed with the idea that internally as the organization, we uh, try to facilitate the dialogue between different sectors. So we were born as an organization to fa facilitate communication with private sector, uh, uh, local governments uh, and civil society organizations and then form a joint uh, understanding of a reform. Uh, the reason why we, uh, we uh, ended up in this health system and uh, starting supporting the reforms and uh, um, building uh, strategies and programs in the health information system reform in Serbia is uh, because a few years ago uh, we started working on something called the Grey Book of Administrative Procedures in the health uh, system in Serbia. It's a book of 50 recommendations how to improve the health system in Serbia and it became actually the reform bible of Serbia in the uh, health sector. So this was one reason how uh, we have been recognized by the government that uh, we know how to identify issues, problems and give recommendations for improvement. Uh, but in the same time as COVID started, um, the government itself noticed something that was very important. There was a, a lot of different players in Serbia that started their own systems, um, health information systems. So we had the health fund, the Ministry of Health, we had the IT office of the government. So each one of them was doing their own thing. Uh, without full coordination. So there was a need uh, to identify someone who can help on one hand with private sector and understand the private sector perspective. And on the other hand, has experience with the government itself to coordinate the government. Believe it or not, in Serbia, one of the challenges is to coordinate different parts of the government at the local level, but also the national level, different ministries, uh, different institutions have their own agendas. So in order to raise funding from the donors, in order, in order to uh, utilize the funding that already exists in the government for the health reform, the idea was that we join forces and found, uh, we founded, government founded this coordination body that consists of 50 different institutions. And Naled uh, is involved to help coordination and facilitation of the process within this coordination body. Our prime role of, of the coordination body is to develop something called um, program for uh, digitalization of health system. Uh, program is a strategy, a long-term plan of the government. Uh, what are gonna be the health information systems that will be used, how we will integrate them, who is possible for integration, for development, for involving private sector. So these are the things that we are, uh, are going to produce by working on the, on, on the program. So uh, why is the program, um, our role is here important because uh, it was hard for the government to identify who's going to lead uh, the dialogue. And it, uh, I know that it might seem uh, strange, but um, they found that it's uh, the best to use the, the local organization that doesn't have the vested interest into one, two, or three, or has a previous, a previous, um, let's say, um, bad relationship with each other. So we had very good relationship with different entities, and so we were given the chance to help the coordination. And uh, one of the reasons why we are doing this program, first of all, to make all of these projects, health information system projects, coordinate better. That's the one. Second is priorities. Uh, majority of donors uh, were 
telling us that there is an issue in, in identifying what is the priority of the government, which programs, which projects, which IT support is needed in, in the health information system. So by developing the program, um, this will, this will uh, help the donor community and the government to kind of uh, direct their funding in, in the right direction. Um, also, uh, there was a, a, let's say, not so good experience of the, of the previous donors when they were funding some of the projects uh, that they were not uh, being used after it. So the, the role of NAD is uh, um, in addition to, to make it sustainable. So we are going to follow um, the program from the development to the implementation and will help the government in implementation and will be uh, someone who has the interest in Serbia meaning to stay here and make the health um, system in Serbia work better because we will we'll live here and we plan to stay here. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is how uh, our role is perceived um, right now uh, by the government. This is why um, we are coordinating uh, this whole effort. We hope that we will continue and, uh, and finish this program and develop the program by the end of the year so that we can then uh, have the donor coordination uh, meetings and understand who can fund what and how we can jointly uh, link all of these projects together to, uh, to fit them well with the needs of, of, the, of the government. I wanted to mention, and I didn't say, uh, I started, that COVID helped us uh, start. Uh, this is the, the reason is um, because uh, during the COVID we needed the access to information as soon as possible to make fast decisions by the government and it was uh, almost impossible. Although we had so many different uh, health information systems, they didn't coordinate with each other, they didn't communicate with each other. So this was uh, uh, the issue, uh, the responsibility, who has, who is the responsible for the data and the information that can be important for policy making. Excellent. Thanks very much, Elena. As expected, uh, you brought up some really critical issues. One is coordination, clearly, and the role that a local organization that has the appropriate context can play in that uh, coordination. Uh, assisting with prioritization, always a tough one, I think. So I'm glad that you opened that door for conversation and hear about how, you know, uh, potentially support can be given to prioritization of initiatives, of activities, et cetera. Uh, we, could, we could probably talk about that, about that as well. Um, thank you. I'm going to move to our final panelist. Um, and our final panelist of the day today is actually a core partner on CHISU representing vital strategies. His name is Richard Delaney. <laughs> Richard is a principal technical, or is the principal technical advisor at Vital Strategies, a core partner, of course, on CHISU. Um, Richard focuses on promoting the effective use of data in public health decision making. Through his work on the Bloomberg Data for Health Initiative, Richard has collaborated with public health organization in, in organizations in over 15 countries in Asia, Africa, and South America. He has developed programs that have helped diverse stakeholders to access, interpret, and act upon critical insights from public health data. Richard has also run a consulting practice and was a senior official in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for six years. He also directed leadership training programs for New York University's Graduate School of Public Service. Mr. Delaney has a Master of Public Policy from Harvard and a Bachelor of Arts from Swarthmore College. Richard, you worked with local partners, obviously, in your many different contexts on mm -hmm. data use, the MOH being considered one of them. What we often find is this nuance of the MOH being a local institution or local partner is missed in conversation. And we'd like your perspective on the MOH as a, or the Ministry of Health as a local partner and how that can contribute towards strengthening the HIS. <clears throat> So our question for you is what advice would you give to country governments who find themselves in this situation where they are receiving funding to strengthen the HIS while also developing their own capacity to lead the evolution of the health information system over time? Over to you, Richard. Well, thank you, Derek. And uh, thank you everybody for making the time to, uh, to be part of this um, webinar today. Um, I think, um, as, as Derek mentioned, we've worked um, in a lot of countries working um, to strengthen the use of data through uh, 
uh, information systems and through other practices. And, and through that process, I think we've, we've kind of found four critical areas where, me, where ministries of health are essential in, in those types of, of projects. Um, the first area is in specifying not just the needs in the, from a country perspective, from the decision maker perspective in the ministries of health, but also the priorities, because um, the needs in, in, in this space are quite large and larger than any project, no matter how big the project may be, more than one project can, can, can address. And so there's always this sort of notion of the prioritization of needs. Uh, and so one of the areas that we look to ministries of health to provide uh, is their perspective on what are the priorities for data use, for data availability um, that will have the most impact on public health decision making. So one, that's one, the first sort of critical role that ministries of health play in these types of, of, of health information system strengthening projects. Um, the second that things that I think we look for and that, that ministries of health in, in, in order to be effective collaborators on these types of projects um, is to provide context and connection. Um, because this is such a big space with lots of actors working and lots of projects uh, from multiple funders, uh, as well as work that ministries may be supporting internally on their own without uh, a third party funding source. There's a lot of, of activity in this space of making data more accessible and more usable. And so um, in, addition to in addition to providing priorities, we look to ministries of health to provide context and connection to think about how one project may uh, dovetail with another project and to think about how the synergy between multiple projects creates uh, um, more impact than they could in the individual. So prioritization, uh, context, second thing. Third thing, um, um, you know, many of our projects, like the Chisu project that Derek and I um, uh, work on, um, it, uh, is a, um, um, you know, it has a, a number of models that we, um, and a, a number of approaches that we have, um, that we, have developed that are uh, we think are effective, um, but they all need to be adapted to a local context to to think about how this type of of strategy that may have worked in other places can be adapted and applied in a local context, and that this is sort of where um, ministries really uh, help to. Uh, 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 act as collaborators and co-creators of, of these models and, and interventions and not just a passive, you know, sort of receiving programs and, and, and a technical assistance that is provided in other places, but really to be active partners in adapting and applying these general approaches to the, to the specific um, uh, needs of, of, of public health decision makers locally. Um, the final thing that, that we sort of say, so if, uh, we sort of look to for ministries of health um, is um, institutionalization. Um, none of the work that any type of project, and again, no matter how big or how, um, um, how, how many years it may be, um, any of these projects are going to have a time limit. There's going to be a point where the project ends and there is a, um, a need for, as Derek mentioned in his opening remarks, managerial continuity, where, where there's a continuity of, of applications that, ha that, that happen after a project. And so again, I think one of the things where ministries of health are critical in doing this is, is sort of is, is understanding how to, where institutionalization occurs, where does this continuity uh, happen? And, and to be thinking about that at the beginning of the, of the project rather than at the end. And, and so, um, um, you know, I think that's one of those common challenges is, is this question of institutionalization and continuity uh, is deferred 
until you know when when you're getting to that point where we're saying we're winding down. How do we do this? I think what we look to for for, for ministries um, is to think about these these um, um, this question of institutionalization from from the start. So so again, I think kind of the four things sort of thinking about where ministries act as effective local partners for providing. Um, um, insights about priorities um, in in the health information uh, strengthening uh, space to connect um, uh, efforts that may be happening from one fund, funding partner with others so that there's synergy across those those different types of efforts to be active partners in adapting and applying different models different technical assistance and making them really resonate in the local situation um, uh, rather than just being kind of a generic model that's kind of brought in from, from the outside. And finally, being uh, from, from the very start, building in this question about what happens after a project ends and how does this, uh, uh, this effort uh, continue and become institutionalized. Um, so Derek, that's... Uh, um, um, back to you on, on that. So that, that was my, my overview of this. this Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Uh, excellent, Richard. Thanks very much. So uh, if I try very quickly to summarize key points, um, please tell us what you need and what's most important. Uh, please tell us who you're currently working with and who we should be working with, especially local partners, uh, so that we can ensure that this continues into perpetuity and doesn't kind of die a natural death. Uh, where do we plug in? You know, that's always the tricky bit, right? Where do we plug in? Um, and uh, where do we plug in in such a way that our ideas can be adapted to what the local context is? And then I like the last point, which is about how do we, how do we start to prepare at the beginning? So how do we start to prepare at the beginning for what will happen, you know, once this short-term kind of intervention happens. So really great thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Richard. I'm going to mention something very quickly now for the benefit of our attendees that, you know, the Q&A box, you'll find it at the bottom of, um, of the screen. Please look at that. If it's not working very well, go ahead and throw your question in the chat so that we can capture your questions. Uh, we have a few additional questions that we're going to go back to our panelists uh, with right away. So I'm going to start with um, I'm going to start with Lynette uh, and see if we can dig a little bit more from your initial uh, comments and initial discussion that we had. So I'd like uh, Lynette to expand a little bit more on your interaction with organizational capacity strengthening for Data Science Limited. Um, I, I don't know if that's happened, uh, you know, in what way, what shape or form it happened, but uh, what I'd like for you to share with us is, you know, would you recommend the experiences that you have had with organizational capacity strengthening for your local organization? Um, and, uh, you know, what, what would you recommend for uh, upcoming local partners? Um, would you point them to something else uh, different to what you've experienced? <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Thanks, Lynette. Yes, uh, thanks, Derek. Uh, I think it's interesting to see how capacity development and skill strengthening has really made a comeback. There was a time, you know, this had a, a really bad rapport in the ecosystem uh, because of many people who were taking advantage of it. But capacity development is very, very important. And I think it's important because, um, you know, uh, one of the speakers was talking about uh, jargon. Uh, in most cases, you know, technical people, we like to speak to ourselves and we write for ourselves. We do not, um, you know, in most cases, consider uh, other people um, and, and, and write in plain English, uh, for example, uh, for uh, people to consume our products, our services, you know, our material uh, very easily. I'll give you a very good example uh, at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, uh, where I lead a few projects in Africa. Um, we have just concluded, um, you know, uh, a, so we're doing a data science uh, 
capacity development for African countries. And the approach that we took is we worked with uh, 14 countries um, and they went through a rigorous one month uh, training with uh, one of the partners, uh, the Africa Institute for Mathematical Sciences. And after the one month, five countries were selected and they were given fellows. So fellows are alumni of uh, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, also known as AIMS. So the alumni have been embedded in the five countries to continue giving capacity to to, um, you know, uh, officers from the five countries who had already undergone as part of the bigger group of 14 um, uh, training in data science. And, you know, these are statisticians working in national statistical offices, and they had to start off with introduction to Python programming and, you know, uh, data analysis, uh, analysis, data visualization, and kind of alternative methods. Uh, some of the other trainings that we do is in, you know, use of standard data for economic and business monitoring. And why am I telling this? Why is this even important? With the work that we do, we bring very technical solutions um, to um, organizations, individuals who have never experienced these uh, technical solutions. And in some cases, some people might take advantage of that, especially when it comes to licensing uh, and all that, uh, intellectual property, and come in and give solutions without giving capacity. That means you need them for a very long time. Uh, but we want to move away from that, which is, give a tool, give the capacity, let the clients decide that, okay, yeah, it's good that we know, but that's not our core. We would like to outsource that to you and continue. So it doesn't look like you're trying to cheat anyone uh, out of anything. Uh, so capacity development is very, very important. Um, we at Data Science, and uh, we have a, a design mantra, we say, if it comes with a manual, it's already too difficult. Uh, so we try to make things as simple as possible so that as soon as someone uh, unboxes it, as soon as they open it, they can intuitively go in and start interacting with it. But if, if you know, but capacity development has to happen. And capacity development is not just a technical here's the code and here's how it works. It's even the thinking uh, of what you have built and how you're thinking about it in the future. How are you thinking about sustainability uh, of these products? And how are you thinking about sustainability of these services? And kind of having a brainstorm session uh, with the clients. So I would definitely recommend uh, capacity development and just moving away from thinking that capacity development is simply showing people how things work um, and starting to think that capacity development is also about thinking together through uh, the future of solutions and the future of uh, services that are being offered so that they can be improved, they can be made more robust and they can be more inclusive. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So, but that money, money, Linux. let's talk about I know, that. I know, I wish I had more. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. so, so you hear donors being concerned about grants and uh, whether you have, you know, sufficient capacity to manage these grants and to you know report on them etc what 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 are your what's your take on on all of that um one of the reasons why for example i personally and unfortunately then affects the organization's decisions uh stay away from um, uh, from fr from grants and, and and such is the reporting that comes uh that comes with it um if you ever ask me to write a document at most i like to do three page documents uh but there are people who like 100 page 50 page you know 100 page documents and i say i could write you a 100 page document that can be summarized in three pages uh right so um and so when this money comes in, sometimes you spend half of it on reporting, on documenting the processes, and uh, there's really not enough to, uh, to focus on the work. And documenting and reporting, don't get me wrong, are very important, um, right. but we also need to look at what uh, are the objectives. And unfortunately, and I have you know, uh, done work, especially for government, where you're asked to write a 100-page report for no one to read, but for just in case. It is just in case the auditors come, I have the mm -hmm. report that shows. Mm -hmm. uh, just in case, you know, I can't show them the code, but I can show them the documentation, which, 
does not make sense. This is a whole you know, value to... addition conversation, isn't it? Yeah, like, <laughs> yes. Are you actually yes, adding yes, value? Yes. Are you actually making a meaningful contribution? <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Thanks very much, Lynette. Let, let me hear from, I, I want to hear a little bit more from, from Ben. So Ben, uh, let's carry on with jargon, right? We talked about jargon and we've heard of country ownership. We've heard of the journey to self-reliance. These are things that have been mentioned before, and I'm sure you've heard as well as a local organization. Um, and what I'd like to hear from you, Ben, is what key innovations or initiatives in, you know, in your view have traction in the HIS strengthening space that you really think will enhance local um, partner engagement in countries. So what's out there that's sort of gaining traction that, that can actually make that meaningful connection with local partner engagement? Well, that's a huge question, Derek. I'm not sure which angle of that to take. I, I think there are um, innovations that are becoming more attractive to the donor community, uh, but I think probably more important, um, especially in terms of local institutions trying to position themselves uh, just recognizing that the donor community are the ones making this market. Um, there's not really um, an entrepreneurship path for an HIS organization um, outside of the top line revenue streams that are going to be provided by uh, USAID, CDC, FCDO, Gates, or any of the, the mega donors. Um, and in those spaces, uh, innovation will be defined exactly the way that they want it to be defined. And, and so there may be some room for organizations to explore accelerating technologies. We've seen um, AI and machine learning come to the forefront quite a bit these days. Uh, and that seems to have caught USAID's attention um, somewhat, even though those technologies are, are way past usually the absorption capacity of most target countries. Uh, that, that can be something that could be considered innovative, but if you seek to innovate outside the boundaries of what the donors are asking for, uh, oftentimes that can come back and be harmful. And so uh, I, I, I emphasize so much, or uh, sorry, empathize with what Lynette was saying, that there are so many inefficiencies and um, uh, what would you say, uh, objectives or outputs that don't actually benefit the host countries, but seem to fall lockstep with what donors are asking for. And unfortunately, if you want to be an HIS organization at the local level and stay in the game for the long run, you have to find a way to um, adapt to the requirements that the donors are giving. Um, now, that's not, that's not the case in developed countries. You know, if you look throughout Western Europe and the UK and the US, if you want to be an informatics firm in those markets, then, then you are much more free to sort of define your products and define your services in a way that you believe the clients uh, will, will best benefit the clients. And so in, in many ways, I want, I want Lynette to start marketing herself to, to US clients directly and stay out of uh, development because in that space, your only accountability is whether your clients think it's valuable or not. And, and uh, you see a lot more flexibility there. But in the mm -hmm. developing world, the clients almost don't matter because what's happening is the market is being made by the donors and you have to do what the donors say in order to continue uh, uh, being funded and, and get that organizational continuity. So mm -hmm. uh, again, the, the best thing you can do locally is understand the product that they're asking for, understanding the procurement methodologies that you're required to adhere to. Uh, and mm -hmm. then from the donor side, if, if you are in fact really interested in engaging local organizations, which historically they haven't been interested in it, uh, but if, if that's changing now and they want to, then recognize that they need to do a lot of work on the contracting side, on the communication side, and on the product definition side so that the people on the ground have a better sense of what they're talking about. And I think in a lot of ways, um, Beltway contractors kind of thrive on the vagaries of USAID and CDC contracting because they can have some sort of freedom to work collaboratively to, to define those vagaries and do that while getting uh, paid. Uh, but in the local so context, having a, so like having a voice, it's gonna be more challenging. Yeah, so having that voice is really important to influence the conversation.
That's correct. Can you hear you loud and clear, Ben. Um, I'm going to take liberties and uh, move to Yelena very quickly for a quick question. And then Richard, you'll forgive me. I have done more talking than I should have. So we'll quickly jump to Q&A because I know there are quite a few questions that we want to get through. So Yelena, I have one more question for you, um, which is really an appeal for advice that you can give to regional or national partners, uh, regional meaning, you know, uh, organizations like uh, ACROSS that is covering, you know, several countries within, within a continent or national partners, meaning those that are in a specific uh, local, uh, you know, local space in a specific country. Uh, can you give them some advice about how to embrace partnerships in digitalization, especially where government is not prioritizing the reform or the intervention, right? So your story is a great story where the government is leading this intervention. They're very keen, they want it to happen. Um, whereas, you know, um, there might be these local organizations that do identify the gaps and the opportunities actually lie in moving with the, with a reform form. So can you give them some advice on how to embrace partnerships in that environment? You said it's a quick question, but it's not a quick answer, but I'll try. Uh, I just didn't uh, um, maybe present uh, the, the role well, because it wasn't by the, the government decided and wanted to do the reform in the health uh, system in Serbia. It was kind of a our push as well, but uh, there is something that um, uh, Nalad uh, uh, is known uh, about. This is, we did uh, at least three very huge reforms in Serbia. One was construction permitting reform that lasted for seven years. It moved Serbia, I know it's not that popular talking about doing business report, but it moved Serbia from 186th position to the ninth position in the world. So we've been recognized by helping the government. We did the law, we did the software, we donated the software. And for five years, we were educating and training people that are using this uh, new system and uh, new, new law. Uh, what, what I'm saying, uh, during these seven years, we always had support of the donor community. And in Serbia, now it is recognized as someone who can make a change who does things. So uh, we truly believe that this is a, a necessity uh, for all the region to have at least one, but uh, um, maybe better five, six different local organizations that should be supported by the uh, donor community to build their own uh, capacities to take over some of the reforms. Because without that, it's literally, um, you know, donors are going, believing that the projects are lasting for two years or four years, if we are lucky, you know, and then these people move to some other topic, to some other issue that they uh, deal with, and then uh, the government stays uh, without knowing how to manage things on how to, to continue the project where it, uh, where it stopped. So either help government do it, and I, I find it harder or develop the capacity within the local organization to, to move um, and uh, change things and make the continuum, continuous pressure toward the government. We had a lot of, I know that it seems that like we are hand in hand with the government right now, but we have a lot of uh, pressure that we make through the media to make topics important for the citizens and then it makes the topic important for, for the government. So um, this is uh, the approach. We exist for 15 years and uh, we've been now known by doing the implementation. And um, they don't like us that much. The government usually says they're hard to work with, but the result is there. So, so this is um, the recommendation. Excellent. That's really great. So this, this advocacy idea is a really good one. Thank, thank you for that, Yelena. Okay, uh, you've heard from our panelists. Um, they have more to share, but uh, they will share it in the form of responses to questions that we've had. So I'm going to move to Molly to hear about what questions we're getting from our attendees. Uh, questions, Molly? Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, and thanks for putting all of your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we've got some great ones so far. So I'm going to start with one from Joseph, who asks, what do the speakers think of donor assisted programs um, that can be continued when the assistant ends and the donor leaves. What do the speakers think also about donors focusing more on dealing with government rather than private stakeholders? Okay, anyone can take that one. You can just unmute and go for it. I can start. Um, when it comes to uh, you know, sustainability of uh, programs and projects, 
I think it's very important to think about this. And I have seen many projects, including, uh, you know, some projects that I have led within government, for example, the Open Data Initiative uh, in Kenya, um, very well funded by the World Bank. And as soon as, you know, the uh, donor money expired, um, then the government was not able to put the projects on budget. Um, and it was a very important uh, project. I led it for, uh, you know, about five years and uh, we did, great things but as soon as the money ended and you know the government was not able to pay the consultants the project simply went quiet um i think sustainability really needs to be um implemented and and curated and i would even dare call it design for sustainability when it comes to these projects um and just tying this to the second question is the reason why it's important to work with private sector players is private sector players are thinking about the money um, and how to make it long term. Uh, and for this reason, in most cases, they would think through the projects in a way of how do we sustain it such that in the long term, uh, it's able to you know, do more. Uh, Unfortunately, for whatever reason, maybe if there's someone within the donor community here, we can uh, get that, um, you know, uh, development partners like to work with governments and then government will go in and, and hire private sector institutions. And in most cases, these are, you know, uh, large organizations. So we need to start having that conversation of sustainable projects, uh, sustainable donor funded uh, projects uh, beyond, you know, the financing period. Um, and how the proposals uh, actually reflect this, that these projects can live beyond uh, those periods. Uh, very finally, the unfortunate thing is sometimes financing follows an objective of the development partner or the donor. So they are trying to test out something over a period of three years. So sustainability is really not at the top of their minds. Um, so for that reason, really, coming in and uh, preaching how sustainable this thing is going to be in the long term is really not um, a very big plus, yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Derek. I mean, I, this goes back to a point that I raised in my initial discussion that I, there, there isn't in most of the developing countries, at least that we target throughout Southern and Eastern Africa and Southeast Asia, there are no market mechanisms um, for health informatics outside of the donor community. And so the, the phrase um, uh, sustainable initiatives outside of donor funding uh, is somewhat of an oxymoron. It won't, it won't really happen. Uh, and I think there, the more accountability we bring back to donors to recognize that, that they're the primate market makers, uh, primary market makers in these countries uh, then the more realistic our discussion will be about how programs will often and, and until something else happens, rise and fall on the backs of, of the donor funding. Um, governments may want to continue on um, with the impact that they've seen through a health informatics intervention that's donor funded, uh, but asking them to contribute to that financially is often a zero sum game that creates untenable trade offs and other aspects of their health sector. Um, so, so in our view, and, and this is from what we've seen on the ground over the last 12 or 13 years, uh, there is just there's no marketplace for it. Once the programs come to an end, that's going to be the end of the funding for that initiative, possibly the end of funding for the organizations that supported the initiative. Um, and, and certainly uh, for the impact that was created. Um, and I think the only long term, and, and that's not necessarily a bad, a bad thing. I, when, you're, when you're looking at the trajectory of development, uh, there will be things that are required from external sources. And I think health informatics may just be one of those things. Uh, mm -hmm. And that will carry on until governments are able to fund their own budgets, I think, and decide what they want to pick and choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that prioritization issue again. All right, let's uh, pick up another question, uh, Molly. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to combine a question that came in from Bob as well as Victor. But the question is, for all panelists, what can be done to prevent international funding distorting local markets in the data HIS area, leading to unsustainable wages and loss of labor? Or is this problem overstated? And Victor also asks, 
how can we navigate away from that situation in developing countries where donor determines the market and expects local organizations to only respond to their boundaries and instead move to an improved system that ensures local partners can actually design their innovations to address local context? Um, All right, Richard, I'm gonna to come to you for this one. So uh, in essence, the question is about uh, responding to what Ben was getting at, right? So how do we, how do we turn the tide? How do we, how do we uh, get the local partners to actually have a voice and influence where things are going? Well, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think there is some movement, I, I think, in, in sort of understanding that, that kind of swooping in with a preconceived fix and then swooping out, um, um, you know, and, and having those kind of projects, sort of that kind of design um, is untenable because it doesn't create sort of, you know, lasting um, uh, results uh, uh, around this. Uh, and so I do think that the, the, the part of the approach that we see sort of evolving a little bit more, right, is, is rather than prescribing particular um, solutions, right, Focusing instead on, on what the, um, the outcomes are. And I think this has created some challenges because the outcomes I think that donors want are, is not the implementation of a new HIS system, is not the implementation of some, some you know, dashboard or some other type of thing. What they want is better public health decisions. And once you start talking about what we want is better public health decisions, you in inevitably get to a question of local context, local priorities, local needs, right? Because, you know, whereas you can define, like you should have this system or you should have this, you know, uh, you know this tool or this, you know, uh, uh, structure in, in place. You can kind of define that outside and impose it locally. If you say, what we really want is, is um, changes in decision, that forces this to become more of a local conversation. And I think it, it changes the role of what, um, what these projects are. They're not so much coming in and, and delivering a new product, a new system, but more facilitating a local conversation among local stakeholders. Uh, and so it becomes less about providing technical assistance and more about facilitating a local conversation about technical systems. It is, I think, a um, um, it is more aspirational <laughs> than reality right now. But I do think that there is that kind of movement in a lot of these projects where, where we start to see the these these projects and these initiatives being defined more about the outcome on the ground than on the the product or service that gets it, you know, it, it, it yeah. instituted. Yeah, so less about the project level outcome and more sort of the country level outcome. That's a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, Yelena, you want to add? Yeah, I was kind of nodding all the time while Richard was talking, but uh, generally, um, I feel that uh, I'm, I'm, I've been working in Serbia with at least, at least 20 different donors or even more for the past 20 years. I think USAID is a bit better than, than others uh, in a sense that whenever we worked with USAID, it was like uh, for a year or sometimes even two, but usually a year of these coordination, facilitation, dialogue, understanding the local needs. So at least that helps in um, their future designing of the program. Uh, and what uh, is usually probably something that I mentioned last time, it's uh, how long, what's the, the length of the program. Four years is not enough, you know? So I know that, you know, everybody wants quick results, quick wins, <laughs> something uh, quickly and visible immediately. But uh, unfortunately, if you wanna do it's justice and if you wanna do sustainable uh, programs and projects, you have to have buy-in from the local people from the local organizations and the government and understanding why it's being done and what is the problem that is being addressed and why is this the solution the best. It lasts 
it cannot be done you know, so quickly and immediately and can produce uh, results. So uh, the experience is at least to invest year or two years. I know the cheese and JSI in Serbia are, we're gonna work for a year to understand where we are and what's, what's, the, what's the situation. The good thing in Serbia is that we are now at the uh, level of the, pre, uh, in, the government is doing the analysis of the, of the current uh, system. So it's a right fit, let's say. So uh, we'll have a year to understand where we are and what needs to be improved. But in the same time, I know that Cheese also wants a quick result. So something in between and in parallel, let's do something quick. <laughs> uh, we understand that, but uh, to prove that uh, that Cheese or, or USAID is going to help, I know that it helps to have some results immediately, but in the same time, it doesn't help the, the sustainability of the, of the project. Yeah, it takes time, absolutely. Right, let's pick up another question. Uh, Molly? Great. Um, okay, so we are going to go to Musha's question. Um, so Musha asked, um, Richard, based on your intensive experience, what strategies or learning could you advise when transitioning a digital solution project to the government? Hmm. Um, so, so I think that what, what I, <laughs> sort of things that we can advise again, is, let, me, let me start with. I think that one of the things that happens with digital solution projects are that um, we often push right up to the end in terms of systems development, right? That when there's an end to a project, it, it becomes like, okay, we're gonna take all that time on, on developing this, the, the solution. And so there's this push kind of at the end and then essentially it becomes this, um, if we build it, they will come mentality, which is essentially the focus and the time is spent on, on digital solution development. Um, whereas I think what we find is it's the, the stuff that happens after the solution is created. It is really where, what I was saying earlier, where use and decision-making changes, right? That that doesn't happen automatically. So, so I think that part of the strategy is seeing that adoption, implementation, um, uh, interpretation of, of the results of different, you know, different digital systems. That is actually a long and messy process. And so to some extent, rethinking the timelines that, that, that we have. If we have three years for, for a project, don't think about this as you know, two years of, and two and a half years of systems development, and then you know, um, six months of, of, of transitioning out of it. To, to instead kind of think about this in a more agile way, to think about um, um, delivering different solutions in, in steps and think about how those steps get used all along the line so that you are given as much time, maybe even more time to the, um, the actual uh, productive use of, of some of these solutions oh, rather than all, all in yeah. the, the development of, of, of the solutions. So I think we've all been involved in projects where you, you, you end up with some type of, of, of complex, really, um, you know, sort of powerful Fancy bells and whistles, whistles. <laughs> right? And nobody uses and it. Nobody's going to use it. Absolutely. Nobody I'm going to ask it. Ben if he wants to add. Do you want to add anything to that, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, when we budget for new information systems deployments um, in in southern and eastern Africa, uh, the actual engineering side of it usually doesn't exceed about 10% of the total budget. Um, and that's because the, what, what, you're, what you're aiming to do is change the management systems. You're, you're, you're not actually, the point of health informatics is not health information systems. Uh, the, the point of health information, uh, health informatics is, is management systems. And the process of adapting management systems um, to be agile and nimble and reactive to the data that you're providing uh, is extraordinarily long. Um, uh, you're, you're working with the frontline health workers, you're working with their reporting chain all the way up to the central level for a period of years um, to get them acclimated and comfortable with making decisions based on what this brand new wizardry machine is showing them, you know, and, and their, and their, uh, and their view. And, 
and that's not an easy process. You're you're taking uh, cultural and and uh, professional uh, uh, traditions and upending them uh, based on something that they're seeing in their computer. And that's a really hard thing to do. And if you can't get that correct, then the software shouldn't have been designed in the first place uh, because yeah, the, the whole point is management. So I, I would agree with that, that there is there is a really long investment that needs to happen. And probably in, in our view, just in rough numbers, that should take about 90% of your um, implementation budget. Hmm. Thank you. Let's get maybe two last questions and then we'll call it a day. What do you have, uh, Molly? Okay, so I've combined one from Mibratu and from Job, but what are some proposed methods or strategies for local HIS and digital health organizations to be engaged in this process? This is important for data management and using the data for decision making at national level through integration with other digital platforms. You want to grab that one, Lynette? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I think for me, it goes back to uh, what I mentioned earlier when it comes to capacity development. Um, you have to create that level of uh, buy in. Um, as we know, a lot of the data that we're talking about exists within um, government, uh, you know, MOH uh, uh, type institutions. So uh, it's with in that health uh, system. Um, and in most cases, even within the health system, you will find that most of these organizations work independently and uh, not everything is linked. Uh, so leave alone other systems from outside. So there needs to be uh, a whole lot of uh, sensitization going, going in on why it's important to standardize, to uh, streamline the processes and you know the systems uh, that exist. Um, and this process is, is pretty long. Um, because everyone uh, really has um, their own kind of benefit from uh, holding on to their own systems and not being very open, not integrating, not being interoperable. Uh, so there needs to be a lot of teaching and training and capacity development and peer exchanges, um, especially peer exchanges um, at the very start. Um, I like to say within government, it's riskier to do something new than to do nothing at all. Um, because if you don't do anything, it might, it not, it, mostly it's not going to go wrong, but if you try something new 50% chance that it could go wrong and that, you know, the, the impact of that could, uh, could be, uh, fatal, really. Um, so I think it's important to start with peer exchanges, um, mm. you know, showing who has done it elsewhere and, you know, how successful have they been? What have been their challenges? What have, you know, been their lessons and, and, and how can uh, we avoid uh, uh, some of the challenges and kind of uh, uh, chart a, a success path, uh, so to speak. Um, so I think it's important to start there and start teaching even before we start implementing. In most cases, people come and say, here, let's integrate, let's do this, let's start writing code, let's you know, um, give you money, go out and do that. Um, and sometimes people do it because there's money, uh, but not because mm -hmm. they need um so so and to create where you know um i think it was richard who was talking about build it and they will come um but you know to avoid sometimes they don't come sometimes you build it and you sit there waiting just you and the product um to avoid that you have to create demand and to create demand you have to start by teaching and um and showing what has worked and what hasn't uh so that um you reduce that risk of failure yeah, so breaking down those walls, building trust, very good. Um, Molly, last one. All right, so this last one is from Carolyn, who asks, some or maybe many countries have HIS digital IT roadmaps. How effective have those proven to be? What are some real world successes or pitfalls? And what, ne what needs to be done to straighten them for sustainable localization? Yeah, so everybody has a plan, a really good one. A really nice and shiny one. Um, so in your experience, uh, have these worked? I'm going to give everybody a 30 second uh, contribution and then we'll close. So I'll start with Ben, go to Lynette, Richard and end with Yelena. Ben. Great. Yeah, I, you know, th there are two countries that I, I won't name them in case other countries get upset, but there are two countries in the roughly 20 or 30 I've supported 
that have digital roadmaps that have been effective. And I can say without a doubt, the reason they've been effective is because the countries themselves develop those roadmaps independent of donor um, initiative and, and they've stuck and they've, they've required, some of you will know these countries as I'm describing them, they've required and even forced implementing partners to adhere to those roadmaps as donors come in with different priorities and whatnot. And it's been incredibly effective. Um, the other countries that we've supported that have the roadmaps that were designed and developed because the donors wanted them developed um, haven't stuck. And that's because the champion and the champions at the ministry and the local organizations uh, didn't really have the intrinsic motivation. It was just sort of a reaction to get the funding. Um, so we I would say more countries it. taking stronger leadership and that's what's gonna make it happen. Perfect, Lynette, your 30 seconds. Yes, um, I, I really like what's, what, what Ben has said. And in technology, we say execution matters. You can plan all you want, but if you do not execute, it's really dead. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, and Ben has, you know, said it so beautifully, if the demand does not come from the country, they're simply receiving the money because a donor has money to spend. So we really need to be careful when it comes to, you know, developing some of these documents and, you know, these roadmaps, as I said earlier, sometimes, you know, these are developed to be um, saved for future research, uh, but then not for immediate implementation. And that's a shame. So there needs to be a way of creating that demand. Uh, part of my work at the Global Partnership, we say, we only give um, partner countries um, solutions that they request. We do not come with right. technical partners and tell them it's um, JSI, for example, and they're offering this ticket. It is JSI, here is country X that wants this. Do you need it? Are you asking for it? Absolutely. Exactly. exactly. All right, yeah. Richard. Um, agree with both Lynette and Ben on everything they said. I would say one other thing to think about is what, what is success? And success isn't necessarily that the roadmap is followed precisely. But I think where we've seen these types of roadmaps be successful is they engage local stakeholders in a meaningful conversation. It sets out a meaningful direction, but it is adaptable over time. And it goes back to both of what Ben and Lynette say, is that people don't use the plan. It, 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 it's been generated for somebody else. And to make it a living, breathing, adapting document really does require that it's generated locally and not because of some external, uh, external mandate. So the places where it's been successful, it isn't that we've seen, isn't it been that it's because it's successful because every piece of the roadmap was implemented as defined. It is yeah. that- Is it, it mine it provides... and, and am I in it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, Yelena, last word. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's not about um, is it implemented at the end, at least for, for, uh, from our perspective, it's about the process itself. Because really through the process, we learn from each other, we participate together, we understand each other. And when we are designing new projects and programs and uh, approaches, then we know how to fit it best so that it fits all the needs. For us, the process of programming, making the strategy is the one that is important. What we proved is when we designed the program in such a way, it was always implemented in 70, 80%. If it's designed by the, doesn't matter if it's donor community or who, but, but a person, uh, an expert, or it doesn't get uh, implemented and it's not important for, for nobody. So uh, the, the process itself, it, but... <laughs> the, the process itself in Serbia, at least, this is the yep. Something that moves and makes uh, changes in implementation. Is it going to be implementable or not? Absolutely. Thank you. Fantastic panel. Please help me thank Yelena, Richard, Lin Lynette, uh, Ben. Absolutely fantastic to have a chat with you today. I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And I hope our attendees, I can gauge from the questions that they were plugging in and enjoying it immensely as well. Uh, this is the last of um, our monthly webinars. You will be hearing from Chisu again at the beginning of uh, probably in October is when we will have our next uh, webinar. So look out for that and you'll get invites. Uh, something has popped up on your screens, a poll to just let us know how we did. So please, uh, can you respond to that poll and let us know whether this was valuable, but again, you know, thank you so much for your interest in country health information systems and how they can be strengthened. 
I think the local partners that we had on our panel today really did uh, justice to that conversation. And uh, as soon as you've uh, responded to the poll, you're free to leave. Uh, again, thank you. Yelena, Richard, Lynette, Ben, thanks so much. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you again in a few months.